crystallizing our declaration of principles into a set of key questions and actions to try to set an agenda for health futures. Uh, somebody said in, in the Twitter feed that we needed to move towards a phrenesis, using the Aristotelian term, the need for practical wisdom. And I think that's what we're hoping this final session will be bringing us. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage, um, back onto the stage, Ellen McRae, who is the uh, president of the Edinburgh University Students Association, Professor Liz Grant, who is my colleague and friend and assistant principal global health at the University of Edinburgh, the Honourable Dr. Kirsty Duncan, who is Deputy House Leader of the Government of Canada, and she is also one of our leading alumni. Welcome home, Kirsty. And then Professor Julio Frank, who is the President of the University of Miami and formerly Secretary of Health in Mexico. And finally, last but not least, Peter Singer, who is Assistant Director General and Special Advisor to Dr. Treadross, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization. So welcome all. We're going to begin this session with some feedback from our local and global audiences. And our first speaker is going to be Ellen McRae, who will report back on the manifesto for change which our students community has been co-creating over the past few weeks. So Ellen, can I hand over to you now? Really exciting. I um, appreciate that there are still so many students out of those workshops as well who have still been able to engage and participate in today's event as well, which has just been really excellent. I think it's been really um, refreshing to hear the reflections and the acknowledgement perhaps of um, of shortfalls um, and lessons learned from the coronavirus pandemic. And these shortfalls tend to be an implementation um, and hopefully a manifesto can move towards addressing this. But still all of these global health leaders um, led with a tone of optimism about our collective future. And that's something that I'm really gonna take away from this, um, from this whole event. Um, I think our manifesto looks towards um, focusing on building capacity across all countries um, and this really interlinks with equitable education. Another really important point that I think has been touched on quite a lot today is um, how we use our data um, and making sure this has equal and open access, but not just how we use this data and how people have access to it, but the ways in which we present it and how we engage with um, other communities, the public um, and parts of politics as well. Um, there was a really nice reflection on how health is in everything and it's a very circular process. There's connectivity in every aspect, um, including education, health and the environment, the health of our planet. Um, and there were comments about seeing this as a whole rather than those different fragments. They, we have stakeholders um, who are excellent in every single aspect of this. There is no deficit of no knowledge um, and there can be real progress in learning from each other and learning from what others have done right and making sure that we do that as a whole and as a collective community across the entire globe. And I'd really just like to end on reflecting on Professor Phil Cotton's comment, um, which was probably my favourite, in that when you invest in youth, you can expect to be transformed. So I really liked that and would like to thank all of the speakers today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ellen. So you've stolen the words right out of my mouth because it's absolutely true. If you listen to students and you listen to youth, you pre prepare to be transformed. And um, I, we are very excited by the work that the students are doing uh, at the University of Edinburgh. And we're delighted to have you integrated as a core component of our day to day and of the work and declaration of principles that we will take forward. Health is everything. That's a great message. Health is everything. So our second speaker in this session is Liz Grant, who's going to give an overview of the key principles and themes from our expert groups, as well as some of the ideas and inspiration that we have taken from the Twitter feed of our live stream audience. And all of this material that we're collecting today is going to be actually distilled and synthesized and brought into our thinking when we are going to publish a declaration of principles. So thank you very much live stream audience too for all of your input. So Liz, can I hand over to you? And there's so much, it's almost impossible to summarise. Um, so I'm just going to pick out a couple of the, the key threads and themes that have come across. And what's wonderful is that they very much echo, Ellen, what you have said from the student community. 
Um, there, there are messages around access, access to um, data, to education, to innovation, access to the global commons, to really believe what the global commons is. It's the assets that belong to each of us, but we each have responsibility to ensure they're shared. And that's part of a university's responsibility. Not just access, it's how we value others, because how we provide access, how we provide participation, how we enable, facilitate, comes back to how we see each other and believing that it's not about separate sectors of health, agriculture, food, but about people and planet. And people and planet within primary health, within public health, within planetary health, and bringing those together to see a different sort of world. Um, the global audience also emphasised what the students emphasised. We need to think about collaboration in a, in a different way, not sort of um, uh, sets of collaborations, but actually think what does, a, what does an extended network, a fellowship of education look like? A fellowship that reimagines the future of health and it's political and we uh, young people know it's political young people are making the changes and we need to um, provide and support and listen um to the skills and communication of men of, of of everyone um but actually hone those skills as well so that that health remains becomes remains and and cuts at the political stage and finally there's a, you know, if I was to bring those the messages that come out from the the the, the various um, panel members and experts in the groups, is something about creativity, our ability to be creative in health, think differently. It's something about curation. We have all the science, or much much of the science that we need, but we're not curating it in a way that's able to be translated and transferred. Our curation skills need to be upped. And finally, I'll take Phil's word, and it's also the word of Sham Syed. I imagine it's also going to be the word of, it would be, it is the word of Dr. Tedros as well, and the word of many um, of the leaders today. Be compassionate in our role in thinking and reimagining health. Compassion lies at the center as we value each other and value ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. So we have now health is everything, people and planet, curation, innovation, transformation. We're now going to move on to our other speakers and Julio Frank and Peter Singer. Um, and I'm going to invite them to give their reflections on what this means for future action. Where do we as universities and as university communities and as global and as local partners, where do we go next? So can I first invite Professor Julio Frank to the stage to give his thoughts on those questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Makara. And my thanks as well to Professor Grant for inviting me to, to join this very distinguished uh, uh, panel. And my deep thanks to my esteemed colleague, uh, Vice Chancellor Peter Matheson. You know, I, I, I want to reflect on the role of universities, but let me start by saying that it is increasingly clear that the current pandemic is shaping to be one of those watershed moments in human history. There will be a before and an after the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic itself has not been the agent of many changes, but it certainly has been an accelerator uh, of many, many changes. And actually what we're witnessing through it's not just the pandemic, it's truly a confluence of crisis. Of course, there is the public health crisis in itself, a health emergency, the scope of which humanity has not seen in a century. Then there's the financial emergency caused by the pandemic, which has underlined the fact that health is not just a result of economic development, but one of its key determinants. And finally, there is a social emergency the unrest fueled by the inequalities that the two other crises have laid bare, have made much more visible and have accelerated. Now, the extent and depth of impact means that we are starting to think about what a post-pandemic world 
should look like. Even as the pandemic continues to unfold, there is much talk about a new normal, but I believe we have a once in a century opportunity to build a better normal. And in fact, I believe ethically that we owe it to all who have suffered so much during this pandemic to apply the lessons we have learned uh, thus far. And my main message is that universities play a key role in building that better normal. In fact, we cannot build a better normal without universities. And I believe universities play three fundamental roles in both the immediate response to this crisis and then in the long-term changes resulting from them. First, and to begin with, universities obviously have communities to take care of directly. Their students, faculty, staff, and neighbors, which we need to keep safe. Second, in the case of institutions like my own university, the University of Miami, which are home to academic health systems, we become direct providers of patient care. We're taking care of patients uh, are suffering with COVID-19 and other related illnesses. And this gives us an opportunity to use our own response as providers of care to become exemplary institutions, to show how it ought to be done to the rest of society. And then third, our third role, probably the most important, refers to our substantive mission, which is first of all, to educate. Now, this is one of the arenas where the pandemic didn't create the change, but has accelerated profound transformation by forcing into a one year changes in the adoption of technology, particularly online technology, that would probably have taken 10 years to do without the pandemic. But I think the changes go way beyond technology. We need to ask ourselves about the meaning and purpose of education itself. And if something we have learned here, if we can find a teaching moment out of this tragedy, is the about the importance of reciprocity. Pandemics offer one of those rare opportunities where our own personal interest coincides with the interest of our communities. And at a time of so much divisiveness, I think if we can drive that lesson into our students about the commonality of reciprocity, the, the mutuality of interest between our self-interest and the interest of the community, I think we will have done something really extraordinary out of the pandemic. And then there's a research mission in addition to education. And of course, we universities are the source, the major resource of production of knowledge and of the translation of that knowledge into solutions, both to address the pandemic itself, but also the economic and social consequences that I was talking about. Remember, every time there's a new disease, a novel uh, pathogen, there's uncertainty. And we, our researchers, play the role of dissipating the uncertainty, of giving us the illumination we need to navigate the crisis. And part of what uh, the way we advance knowledge is through evaluation and shared learning. <clears throat> we integrate knowledge across disciplines around problems, in this case, a pandemic. So by looking critically and objectively and independently at the reality, we derive lessons that allow us to, be to handle the current pandemic, but also be better prepared for future ones. And I mean, just to state the obvious, the pandemic is a global problem and global problems require global solutions. And knowledge is the quintessential global public good. And knowledge is the product of universities. So we play that crucial, crucial uh, link. Uh, uh, we, we play that link at the interface of a national response, which is absolutely critical, and the global response, because we are interdependent. As we illuminate with evidence, scientifically derived evidence, the basis for international collective action. Uh, the other big role we play is one of the striking features of this pandemic is the enormous variation. This is the same virus affecting the same human species and countries with the exact same level of economic development and similar resources invested in healthcare have performed widely differently. But variation is the source of learning. And for us to evaluate that national response and derive the lessons and then feed that into a process of shared learning among countries, which is itself a global public good, is absolutely critical. If we are to derive the enlightened pathway to find common solutions to common uh, threats. If there's anything, if there are two lessons we have learned from the pandemic, pandemic is first, it is not a natural event. It is as anthropogenic as climate change. 
And therefore, we need to question ourselves the unsustainable ways in which we relate to our environment. And second, the lesson that no country is safe until everyone is safe. Okay. The last thing I will say is we need a comprehensive approach. It is not enough to engage in, in the life sciences, important as they are, on the science of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. We must also engage in communities to understand the deep social inequities that have characterized the distribution of the devastating consequences of the pandemic. And we must also engage the humanities to, to explore ways of keeping ourselves connected through crisis. We are the main source. We have the means for translating knowledge into action, turning life science discoveries into technologies and clinical practice, and also turning social science insight and humanistic creation into healthy behaviors and effective policies. Much work remains to be done before the world will overcome the COVID pandemic and its very serious economic and social consequences. And I am absolutely convinced that most of much of that essential work, work will take place at universities, which is why I think the university, thank the University of Edinburgh for convening us all to imagine a better normal, a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much for those wonderful insights um, and, and reinforcing the really significant role that universities can play both in terms of illuminating the meaning and purpose of what education can be and also you are touching on themes of the democratization of knowledge actually the need that knowledge is democratized and that through evaluation we can address some of the inequities and share knowledge um, amongst ourselves but also amongst wider communities I think those are really really important and very powerful messages so thank you very much for those insights and now can i bring in peter singer who is going to reflect again on what we can do as global and local partners to transform where we are just now so uh, peter can i bring you in now thank you thank you thank you so much it's um really very humbling for me to be here with old friends like julio and kirsty and new friends uh, like uh, Ellen and Liz and yourself, uh, Leslie. Um, I actually wanna start where Julio left off with that conjoint, uh, the conjoint global challenges, the interlinked global challenges of the pandemic, climate, racism, economic inequality, conflict. And there is a common denominator in terms of the solution to these things. And that common denominator is leadership. Leadership, is the ultimate vaccine against the pandemic. And as Julio said, there's a 50 fold difference in mortality rate, cumulative mortality rate among G20 countries in the context of uh, COVID-19. Something explains that. And one of the things that explains that is, uh, is leadership. And when we talk about leadership, I wanna speak directly to the young people and the students who are listening and participating in this conference. One of the key lessons, as Julio said, of the pandemic is it's shone a very harsh light on the pre-existing social and economic inequities. And what I wanna say to young people, to students, is that equity is in your hands. Your leadership matters and arguably your leadership matters the most. So that's actually my overarching message. It's a message that hopefully will connect with you. And I wanna speak directly with that message to the students and the young people who are listening at this great university and across the global audience. If we take a step back and we ask ourselves, how, how can we think about this terrible, terrible global crisis? more than two and a half million lives lost, uh, livelihoods, trillions of dollars in economic damage, and uh, probably the worst, uh, well, it is the worst acute global health crisis in a hundred years, maybe one of the worst global crises. And you've spent a lot of time talking about that today. I think about it as follows. 2020 was the year of public health measures. And what 2020 showed us was the pre-existing social and economic inequities. For example, in my country, Canada, in Toronto, 52% of the people in Toronto come from racialized communities, but 81% of the cases of hospitalized COVID were from racialized communities. 
that really tells you something, the overrepresentation. And that's because people are essential workers and they have to go to work, they go on the subway, there's mobility issues, they may not have access to food, uh, healthy food, there's comorbidity, diabetes, and so on. So 2020, the year of public health and the pre-existing social and economic inequities. 2021, the defining challenge is vaccine equity. We're thankfully seeing the rollout now. Today, the first vaccines came through the COVAX facility uh, to Nigeria. Last week, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire. It's a terrific thing um, to see this rolling out. But only, uh, but, but in high income countries, about 12.4% of the population, 12.6%, 12%, 12 point something percent, have had at least one vaccine dose. And in non-high income countries, middle and lower income countries, only 1.4%. So that's a tenfold difference in vaccine coverage um, between high income countries and non-high income countries. So that's vaccine inequity. And um, that's, uh, that is, I think, something that is being addressed, but something that is really a marker, and that's why Dr. Tedros, and you heard it in his video, has called in the first 100 days uh, of 2021 for the vaccination of health workers and older people and others at high risk to begin in every country in the world in the first 100 days of 2021. So if 2020 is the year of public health measures and equity, and 2021 is the year of vaccines and equity, 2022, hopefully, will be the year of primary health care and an equitable recovery. COVID has significantly disrupted health services, and it does offer us the opportunity to engage communities, to take multi-sectoral approaches, to focus on pandemic preparedness, all of which, by the way, are part and parcel of primary health care properly understood and to uh, lead the way towards recovery. In terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, this, I'll just again remind us how important leadership is. And I think COVID has also shown the importance of the multilateral system. Uh, and I feel proud of the actions of WHO in particular. I feel proud to be part of WHO and proud of Dr. Tedros' leadership. And, and you saw him in the video earlier. So having discussed the critical role of leadership as the ultimate vaccine in the interlinked global challenges and how leadership and equity actually is in your hands as young people and students, having discussed the three phases of COVID where the, the punchline really in each of those phases is equity, I'd now like to turn briefly to what you can do well, firstly, you can sign the Vaccine Equity Declaration and join the movement for vaccine equity, the 100-day movement. And I've put the declaration actually on the hashtag at Edinburgh Futures. Secondly, you can lead as young people. And I've also put on Twitter on that hashtag um, some advice that I have for young people, including a little video. But my top line advice is find a problem and solve it find a problem and solve it, and then find a bigger problem. And there's lots of problems to solve in the wake of uh, COVID. And thirdly, I'd just like to echo what others have said. If there's one thing that all three of these years of COVID has shown, it is the importance of character. The importance of character. And on that regard, the last two words I'd like to leave you with is to be kind, to be kind. And that is a key lesson of COVID overall. Be kind and thank you for your attention. Equity is in your hands. Leadership is the ultimate vaccine. And we are counting on students and young people to show us the way. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter, for those very moving words, actually, and very inspiring words um, with which you ended your contribution there. Being kind, being compassionate, multilateralism, leadership, compassion in leadership, kindness in leadership, 
and the importance of younger people coming through to be the future leaders and leaders now and that we need to listen to young people. So thank you very much indeed, Peter, for those um, those reflections. And now I want to finally bring in um, Dr. Kirsty Duncan, who's going to offer some final reflections on being responsive to action and bringing in again that theme of compassion, being compassionate to need the needs of others. So Kirsty, can I bring you in now? Thank you so much, Leslie. Hello, I'm honored to join this discussion with outstanding panelists, Julio, Peter, and of course, our tremendous Edinburgh hosts, Peter, Liz, and Leslie. Thank you to the University of Edinburgh for bringing the world together today. Thank you to all those who contributed and who joined this incredibly important conversation. It's been a good day and one that must be used to drive change for both a better prepared world and a better future for all. Globally, we know that COVID-19 pandemic remains a public health emergency. We know it is an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a human rights crisis. But we also know COVID-19 very personally. It has touched all our lives, doctors, nurses, frontline workers, survivors, family members, students and communities. And the virus has done so in ways we could not have imagined a year ago. We must address grief, loneliness and stress and provide much needed mental health supports and inspire hope. We must also tackle the glaring inequalities, age, disability, gender, income, race, and more that have been laid bare by the pandemic. Dignity, respect, and compassion, exemplified in so many ways by the faculty, students, and work of the University of Edinburgh must become part of our global vocabulary. As our countries and communities fight to contain cases while rolling out the vaccine, the global rollout has been far from even and fair. As of mid-February, 130 countries had not received a single dose of vaccine. And just 10 countries had administered 75% of all vaccines. We must remember that we are one human family. We are interdependent and what happens to one person can quickly affect many others. A cluster of pneumonia cases just over a year ago has translated into 114 million infections and 2.5 million deaths. If we do not ensure vaccine equity, the virus will continue to spread, to mutate, and will ultimately prolong the pandemic, our vulnerability with devastating impacts. Yet while we respond, we must also be focused on rebuilding a better world, a better world where people, human rights, and healthcare for all are front and center. Going forward, we must all be prepared. Governments, the private sector, and international and non-governmental organizations. When we are not prepared, we face not only deadly impacts, but also devastating economic consequences and new inequalities and vulnerabilities. And a virus can quickly undo any economic progress or impede the sustainable development goals. Just over 100 years ago in 1918, and today in 2020, poverty, hunger, good health and well being, gender equality, racialization, and economic status determine who gets sick, who gets treated, and who survives. We must understand that pandemics result from vulnerabilities we have created through our relationships with our environment, other species, and each other. We must urgently change course. The recovery must respect the rights of future generations. We must increase climate action, locking in carbon neutrality by 2050, and we must protect biodiversity. We must also learn what we always learn following a pandemic, namely that science and public health matter, and not just when we are in crisis. Universities have a crucial role to play in reviewing pandemic response, in helping define lessons, and ensuring that we are better prepared for a future pandemic. And evidence-based advocacy 
Throughout today, we have identified scientific research and public policy questions where Edinburgh and others can make important contributions to our knowledge base. As we think about our shared future, we face choices. Will our collective leadership bring humanity together? Will we accept that we are merely part of one small planet with one human family? Will we accept that we are truly in this together and step to the side of the most vulnerable during the pandemic and beyond? And for us, the most important questions are, what does today's manifesto look like? What will we commit to and what will we deliver? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty, for those very final reflections. Again, very inspiring, reminding us all of our own responsibilities to work as global communities to be transformative. And I love the phrase evidence-based advocacy. Health is everything, people and planet, evidence-based advocacy, our responsibilities as a global community. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of the speakers in this session, to Julio, to Peter, and to Kirsty, and to Liz, and also very much to Ellen as well. So thank you very much. And we're now moving towards the end of our day today. Um, I'm very grateful to everybody who's participated. And over the next few days, we're going to be trying to pull together all of the themes which have emerged from the sessions, including those from our students and also from the Twitter feed too. And we aim to publish a declaration of principles in the week following this event. I'm very, hope, very much hoping that the, the communities that have come together today, both our experts, our grassroots communities, the wider global audience, our student communities, all of these communities that we will stay in touch with each other. That is, we are much stronger as a, as a group of common purpose to actually affect change. And I really hope that we will be able to get positive action out of these conversations that we are, are, are hosting at the University of Edinburgh. So can I bring in my colleague now, Liz, also to offer her final reflections. And just to, to say thank you for what we have heard. And today we, we've referenced from the very first session the fact of a pandemic um, just over 100 years ago. And here we are with this next pandemic, this pandemic we're living through. And I, I quoted the words of W.B. Yeats this morning, the Irish poet who talked about, as he looked at the pandemic, writing in 1919, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. But today, definitely, what you have shown, what this conversation has shown is the centre can be held when there's global cooperation. In fact, there's no other way to hold the centre to bring things together again, unless we have global cooperation um, with kindness, with compassion, with an understanding that we belong to each other. This is the first of the Edinburgh Future Institute series of global conversations on those big challenges. I hope you'll all join us for other ones that are to come. And the next one is on the future economy. And today it's very clear the health and economy are intermeshed. It's one we're thinking, we're bringing these together. So we will send out information about the following. Over to you, Leslie. Thanks very much. Well, on behalf of Liz and myself, can we offer a personal vote of thanks again to everybody who's been involved, all of our speakers, and especially to everybody who's been involved in the organisation of the event. It worked tremendously hard and it's been a great team effort. Um, I want to just finish with the words of one of our delegates today, Ewan Aitken. I hope he's still on the call because he put out um, a, a Q&A. &A. He says a really important thing, which I think sums up a lot of the debates. When we reach out to our neighbours to help meet their needs, so our needs are also met. We should all be signing that vaccine uh, thing that Peter has put into the declaration. Uh, it, it, we should definitely be doing the, the, the vaccine declaration, but meeting our neighbors' needs also meets our needs. And I think that's a, a wonderful phrase to take forward into our future thinking. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Professor Peter Matheson, our Principal and Vice Chancellor, who is going to close our conversation today. But thank you, everybody. It's been an inspiring, insightful and wonderful day. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. So, uh, yes, just a couple of words for me. I'll keep my remarks brief. There are a couple of important thank yous I want to say. But um, first of all, can I just say what a privilege it's been to be 
uh, in the presence, albeit digital, of some great minds during the day. It's been uh, a real learning experience, and I've managed to listen to uh, quite a bit of it this afternoon, which has been really uh, interesting, informative, and as others have said, inspiring. And I think the key uh, obligation that we have at the University of Edinburgh is having hosted this, is to make sure we follow it up, make sure that we turn it into action, make sure that we publish uh, the principles that you've heard about, but also that we take a leading role in trying to turn principles into actions. And I think we'll accept that responsibility gratefully. But um, the University of Edinburgh has been very proud to host the event. Um, as you've heard, it will be, the we hope, the first of many. The next one is at the end of June on the, on the theme of the future economy. Uh, we hope that uh, colleagues will uh, tell their friends and, and, and join themselves, but also bring others along. Um, so uh, I just really want to finish by saying thank you very much to all of the speakers. We had fantastic acceptance rates. We've had a great lineup of, of, of big name speakers, all of whom are very busy people. Um, and for the, fa for the fact that they prioritized the time to spend with us today, uh, I'm very grateful and all of my colleagues at the University of Edinburgh will be very grateful. So thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all the uh, panel and all the audience that have contributed questions and input in various shapes and forms. Um, there are particular thanks to some people behind the scenes. And so in this kind of event, um, we're always very grateful to the people behind the scenes that make it work smoothly. And I just want to pick out a few names specifically. So Rebecca Whitefield, Wendy Ball, Jen Reed, the Edinburgh Futures Institute team, including Siobhan Dunn and Patricia Erskine and the team at Edinburgh First. Uh, thank you to all of them. And thank you very much for your hard work and professionalism, which has been so successful today. The Edinburgh Futures Conversations main organizing committee consists of Leslie McCara and Liz Grant, who you've heard uh, chairing a lot of the sessions, including this one, uh, Chris Cox, Theresa Merrick, Martin Caddick, Gavin Donahue, and Fiona Boyd. And they've all got busy day jobs, and I'm very grateful to them for making the time to work on the Edinburgh Futures Conversations and put together what has been a really fantastic and inspiring program. With that, uh, look out for the publication of our principles for future health, which will be later this week. Come to the future conversations in Edinburgh. When you can travel, please come to Edinburgh itself. It's a fantastic city and um, uh, a university which has a great deal to offer. But until we can see you in person, we will see you in whatever format is available uh, in the next uh, few sessions of these of conversations. Until we meet you in person, stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much for participating today and my very best wishes to you for the rest of the day, wherever you are in the world. So thank you everybody very much indeed for joining us and take care of yourselves. And as, uh, as Peter earlier on said, be kind. That's a pretty good closing message. Be kind to one another. Thank you very much for everything that uh, has taken place during the day today. And with that, we'll close the session um, and see you all sometime in the future. But until then, take care.